Great, thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I will talk a bit about um, the JD-PhD program at, at the end, but just to give you um, a, a heads up on this, there will be um, uh, two, two, three uh, JD-PhD students starting um, at um, McCormick uh, in the fall. One in materials engineering, one in biomedical engineering, and one in computer science. And that's quite a large number, given the fact that we will only be having six new students. It is a small program. So you are well represented um, in the coming year. And uh, I hope you will welcome them um, and encourage them, because doing two degrees at the same time is, is a bit of a challenge. So thank you. Uh, so I wanted to talk uh, to start by telling you um, a story of why I am such a fan of, of, of engineers. Because um, I had an event happen, and I will tell you the story of my problems with it. Many faculty members have difficulties um, with IT issues. I am no exception. I have my nice PC that I take with me wherever I go, and I depend upon, and I've had for a while, and uh, all of a sudden, it started misbehaving. I, t I plug it into my docking stations wherever I go, but it sta started misbehaving, and the screen would go black. So of course, I brought it into my IT folks, who are very good, um, and they tried to see whether there was a virus, whether there was something wrong with the screen. They replaced the hard drive. They gave me a loaner. Nothing happened. The thing kept on happening. It didn't go away. And then I happened to be with a bright young engineer. And he asked me a few questions. Do you have any idea what was wrong with it? No. It was my Fitbit. It was the magnet on my Fitbit that was turning the screen off. <laughs> I, I, I owe him my life. I mean, really, it was, it was a wonderful. So I went back and I told my IT people um, that this, and they were surprised. They had no idea. They had never encountered it before. Um, and so Danko is my, is my savior. And I appreciate him uh, uh, very much. And if you have any questions about Donko, I'll be glad to tell you more things about him. OK. So uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today was um, uh, the role between the roles that are played between science and engineering on the one hand and law on the other. And so to just start by talking about it, the first question is from, from the side of the legal system, uh, does a legal system uh, really need uh, a STEM expert advice? And there is no ambiguity there. If you look at modern cases, they increasingly call for science and technology expertise. Uh, and as you know, the law and science on, and engineering on one hand and the law on the other are not always um, uh, speaking the same language. So it's a bit of a challenge. But the legal system does uh, recognize that it is dependent on all of these forms of uh, expert advice. These are just uh, some, some examples. One example that I haven't put up here um, is, is one where I have been an expert witness because I study uh, legal decision making, judges, juries, and also consumer decision making. So I have done expert work on uh, uh, surveys in um, uh, trademark and deceptive advertising cases. I've also taught scientific evidence. And in all of those areas, I had seen what I was dismayed by. That is, I thought that the quality of much of the expert testimony that I saw was not very good. And I was concerned that either the um, uh, uh, best scientists and engineers were not being asked for their advice, or they weren't agreeing to participate. 
So I was fortunate to be able to um, uh, look at this uh, through a survey that I did with my uh, colleague Rick Lempert. And this is the claim that you often see, that scientists tend to be leery of lawyers and the legal process, um, preferring not to venture into the courtroom. Uh, and we really didn't know the extent to which that was true. Um, and if it was true, what were the reasons for this? And finally, what could we do about it if there was something we could, we could do about it? Uh, so the, uh, as part of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, Public Face of Science project, which is ongoing, um, we were able to conduct a survey of the members of the academy who were in science or engineering fields. And that was um, uh, published at the end of last year in the journal uh, Daedalus. And just in case um, this is not a familiar journal to you, it's sort of <laughs> part of the theme of my, of my talk here. That's the image that's on uh, the journal Daedalus, and that is the maze seen from above um, that Daedalus was famed for. And the idea was you can only see and be inspired by the diversity of perspectives if you look from the top and don't just stand from your own corner um, of, of the maze. Um, Daedalus was the father of Icarus who flew too close to the sun. Okay. The survey population and the sample, just to give you a little bit of an overview um, of it, you can see that a third of the population and a third of the sample uh, were in math and uh, the physical sciences. Uh, we also included people who were in the biological sciences and people who were in the social sciences. We got a sample of 366 uh, people to take our survey. Uh, and we asked them, have you ever been asked to assist in the course of a legal proceeding? And somewhat to my surprise, um, over 50%, 54% of them said that they had been asked at least once. So it didn't seem as if the problem was that people weren't being asked. So then the next question is, well, have you ever participated when you were asked? And those who were asked, 90% said that they participated at least once. Now, that's very rosy, right? That sounds really terrific. But of course, participating at least once is not the same thing as um, being regularly engaged. And there is still a set of problems associated with participation. So we also asked, well, why had you refused on those occasions that you had refused? And 66% said um, that there were timing issues. So, you know, these are busy people. These are members of the academy who have other things to do with their, um, uh, with their research time um, and other demands on them, like students. And they are less likely um, uh, to have free time to participate. 49% said, outside my area of expertise. Now that's more of a problem for our um, intersection between law and science and engineering because it suggests that there's a kind of a mismatch going on when people are being approached for their expertise. And that's something we should be working on in order to be able to come up with pairings that give the legal system, the kind of expertise it, you, it needs. The other um, major area that was problematic for some people in participating was that they had doubts about the structure of the legal system and its processes. Now, you've seen lots of TV programs about the adversary system, you have some sense uh, that the adversary system can be a little bit grueling. And sometimes they complained about the fact that the lawyers are not after the truth, right? They're only after winning their side, which is true, right? Um, and uh, they complained 
that they didn't have the freedom to talk um, the way they would like to talk to explain the points when it came time to a hearing. They were kind of confined by this question and answer uh, uh, structure. They're used to being the teachers, not the, um, not the students, right? Um, and uh, so, the, so there are some problems lurking there. And I will come back to that at the end of the talk. But for now, I want to show you some other data um, uh, from the, the study. And this is, um, we asked a series of questions about their reasons for participation. And 84% agreed strongly or uh, just agreed um, that scientists should help out when their expertise um, is, is relevant. So that's kind of a, an obligation to engage that um, is a kind of refreshing thing that uh, I was pleased to see. 33% um, agree or strongly agree that serving as a an expert witness is a good way to keep up uh, on the uh, real world and real world implications. Um, and interestingly enough, almost half of those who had actually participated expressed that view, fewer of those who didn't have participation experience. So at least among those who participated, they are reporting that that experience has been associated with um, uh, getting in touch with the real world. So that's a theme that I'll be coming back to in the other pieces of data. And this is a general theme about what we would call escaping the silo and having some sense that there's another world out there. And consistent with the whole brain idea of these talks, I think it's very easy when you are in law school or you are in a PhD program to be kind of siloed in your perspective. I think maybe engineers are less victims of that than other, some other kinds of fields. Um, maybe you think a little bit more broadly, um, but it's always a somewhat narrowing experience to focus on the exams that you're going to be taking and the, the narrow project that's going on in your lab. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that getting out of that in all sorts of ways, and the legal system is, is one way, um, it, getting out of that is a way that will make your own work better um, and will give you a fuller perspective. And finally, um, uh, surprisingly, uh, among the, this group, 60% um, viewed the legal system as uh, handling science and engineering um, either well or uh, very successfully, somewhat or very successfully. Now that still means 40% said not, right? So that's not exactly a uniform um, uh, uh, vote for it. But 70% uh, 70 70 of those who had participated were on the positive side versus 53% um, who hadn't. Yeah. It is very highly profitable. <laughs> so do you know, we did ask about fees, um, and as fees as motivators. Um, and and that's, that is important. Um, it was always combined with other things, right? Now it may be that our sample of uh, members of the academy are um, more highly paid than the average uh, 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 scientist or engineer who participates in the legal system. So it may be less of a motivator for them um, than to others. Um, but Julio's point is exactly right. It is very lucrative. Um, and that certainly is not an incentive to sniff at after you've been in a PhD program for a long time. <laughs> right? Okay, so we asked about your most recent case. And we asked, well, you know, which of these um, gave you a professional payoff? And the distribution, there are three slides for this. So the distribution of these uh, is, is, is a bit telling. Um, so your status in the field, 12.5%. 
So gaining status in the field, not so much. Right? Now again, these folks are already at a stage where gaining status in their field may not be a likely um, uh, need or, or event, um, but still that's, a, that's modest. Uh, invitations to speak or otherwise um, reflect publicly on the, on the topic, again, uh, relatively low. And sad to say, financial support for students was the lowest of the uh, categories. So from doing this kind of work, uh, you're not going to be able to support um, your stu students in most cases. But um, we move along. Future consulting or other job opportunities, that uh, does get uh, up there a bit. But disappointingly, access to data that you couldn't have otherwise obtained, which we thought might be an incentive um, uh, and, and a payoff for, uh, for uh, participation, uh, didn't uh, do as well as we had hoped. Publications, not directly, same thing. 16.7%, not all that high. Well, what were the big ones? Useful knowledge about an area which you would otherwise not become familiar with. And that's the piece I mean about being outside the silo, of being exposed. These folks are creative and open kinds of people and that's one of the attractions and payoffs um, to being involved in the legal system. And very useful information for teaching. Um, almost half of them uh, talk about that experience. Now, I teach trademark law, and um, I have used cases from, my tra from, from, ex from consulting in my trademark law case. And I think it makes me a better teacher um, uh, those are experiences that the students seem, seem to value. Okay, so now I'm going to give you just a, um, an example of silo problems and maybe an insight from silos. Now, you know that in 2016, a member of the Northwestern faculty won the Nobel Prize um, in chemistry. And when I spoke with him about it, he talked a lot about going across disciplines. Um, there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinary investigation, and we, it's become kind of a watchword. Um, but I think taking it seriously at the very highest levels, like a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, but also at a very mundane, lower level, um, is, is an important way of approaching your problems and your interests. Uh, so I'm going to give you an example um, from my research experience. This is not Nobel Prize chemistry. This is low-level social science kind of stuff, but maybe it'll make the point um, about that. Okay, here is an English courtroom um, in 1809. And you can see here is the jury box. Right? The jurors are all nicely ensconced in that jury box. There are some differences today than they were all men, all white men, um, but, um, but there's the box and the judge is up there. And uh, you could imagine walking in there as a modern lawyer and feeling fairly comfortable in there. Right? Here's a modern courtroom. Here's the jury box. There's the judge. The chairs, I think, are more comfortable. Um, and uh, there are no people in this one, but the judge wouldn't be wearing a wig and a gown. right? Um, so there are differences, but they are really modest differences. Uh, so now let's look at a case, a trial, and what occurs in the course of a trial. Imagine um, a patent trial, okay? a civil case, 
Starts with jury selection, plaintiff's opening statement, then defense opening statement, then the plaintiff's witnesses, including the experts cross-examined by the uh, defense, then the defense witnesses presented and cross-examined by the plaintiff, okay? and then uh, closing arguments by both parties. The plaintiff first, because they have the burden of proof, the defendant second, and then a little rebuttal from the plaintiff, because they have the burden of proof. This is pretty close to a description of what you would see in almost any courtroom in the United States. Then the jury gets the case. And I put a little, kind of, the V is meant to be a little funnel, the jury instructions being read to the jury. Um, then the jury deliberates, the black box. And out comes the jury verdict. Pretty standard stuff. Well, there are some problems, and there have been some problems. And the problems in this legal silo, two major ones, have been what I call the kettleful of law. Um, this is actually a quote from an old, old uh, uh, judge who um, said that jury instructions are given to the jury at the end of the case, um, a kettle full of law that would make a third year law student blanch. Then the other part is the challenges of expert testimony. Okay. Jurors are not experts, uh, actually neither are judges, right? Um, so understanding scientific and engineering testimony is a challenge for them. Um, so these are the problems. What happened? Looking outside um, the silo. And uh, Mike Dan uh, turned to an educational model, I would say also a psychological learning model. Um, and said, well, no, really, it doesn't have to be the way we have seen trials conducted all of this time. What we could do is we could modify things that we know are consistent with good le learning theory. Okay. And what do we do? Instead of having the judge stand there and read the instructions, and the juror's supposed to remember them and <coughs> apply them, we could actually supply written copies of the instructions. We could rewrite the instructions so that they aren't in statutory language, but actually are in language that somebody who uh, didn't go to law school might have a chance of understanding. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I should say, these sound like obvious things, but I serve on the Pattern Jury Instructions Committee for the Seventh Circuit, um, and we sit around the table with prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and it's hard to write clear instructions. It is not an easy thing. And part of it is because there may be disagreement on the meaning of some of the statutory language. It isn't simply a matter of um, writing short words. Um, and writing clear sentences is not easy. Uh, finally, um, I in this area, the timing of the instructions. Remember the order in the which I told you the uh, case proceeds? And you get jury selection, all the evidence, closing arguments, and then, oh, by the way, the legal instructions. So, as if you went to a baseball game and you came from Argentina, and you had not seen a baseball game before, and nobody told you the rules until the end of the game. It would be hard to follow and figure out what was important that was going on. Okay. So we have uh, 
talked about the timing of instructions, maybe a preliminary instructions on the law at the beginning of the case, and then more complete instructions at the end. Uh, when it came, comes to expert testimony, remember the order of the trial. The plaintiff's expert may appear on day two, and the defense expert may appear, well, whenever. Depends on how long the trial is. If you have ever thought about matching competing ideas and taking an evaluation of which one makes the most sense, having that distance between those two presentations is very, makes it much harder. So disrupting the order of the standard trial to allow for direct comparison is one of the changes that can facilitate comprehension of the, of the um, testimony and of what is in disagreement between, between the experts. And finally in this list, um, permitting juror questions. Remember the black box, right? In goes all this stuff and out comes the verdict. Okay? And the jurors are supposed to sit there throughout the trial um, like potted plants. They are passive observers. Actually, I haven't asked you any questions yet, so it's probably um, not, uh, uh, not too far from this little lecture, but you'll get your chance at questions, I promise. Okay. Um, so allowing jurors to submit questions for, uh, for witnesses is a way to facilitate their understanding and we've done some research on that. It does facilitate understanding. And each of these things, each of these sounds sensible, doesn't it? Each of these suggestions runs into a set of obstacles on implementation that are serious, severe, and come at least in part from two sources. One is the notion that, well, we've always done it this way, and so therefore, that's the way we do things. And we get verdicts, you know, they come out the other end, right? And the other is from attorneys who have concerns about letting go of control. And so the idea of running things themselves is what they're used to and what they want. Now, one of the interesting things that has happened with some of these is that permitting juror questions, which attorneys were worried about, and ju some judges said, well, but maybe it would be good to know what they're thinking um, while you can do, still do something about it, right? Um, and, and attorneys had some major resistance to it. I just talked to a judge last week who was thinking he would like to allow jurors to ask questions, to submit questions for witnesses. Um, and, he, and he said, but I, I want both sides to agree to do it. And that's always a dangerous thing, right? Um, getting both sides, opposing sides, to agree uh, to something. He has the power to implement, but he was reluctant um, to do it. The interesting thing is that while, when we have implemented these procedures, what we find is that the attorneys like them. It's just a matter of having to try it out to see if you, if you like it. I don't know whether this happens in engineering, whether you can get people to try out on a mini basis something to get them to adopt a, 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 an idea that you think actually is going to be a great contribution but they're, they're kind of resistant to, right? So, uh, okay, well, back to what changes we might make that would increase the willingness of distinguished scientists and engineers to, uh, to contribute. Uh, and uh, ordinarily, experts are appointed by, are selected by one side or the other, okay? 
Judges do have the power to make a court-appointed uh, expert appointment and charge the parties for it. Okay. Um, the uh, scientists and engineers in this study were most impressed by that. As you can imagine, uh, adversary uh, uh, attorneys are not quite so impressed by that. And I, actually, I have some mixed feelings about that. This is a, a reform that's been touted by many um, uh, uh, judges, not so many practicing attorneys. Uh, and there's some concern that perhaps if you have a court-appointed expert, that the judge will automatically defer to that person. And that may not be a great idea. Um, permitted to meet privately with opposing expert and write a joint report. Remember how far away the, ju the, uh, the experts are from each, from each other in the traditional trial? Uh, this was appealing to um, a majority of uh, the respondents, that 59% of them said it would increase their willingness to serve as an expert. This is more familiar to the kind of academic back and forth uh, that uh, we engage in as professionals um, in our fields. Could question opposing experts in court and they could question me. That was not popular. Okay? That was not popular. And the way I interpret this is that scientists and engineers don't want to be lawyers. Um, they want to be experts conveying valuable information to an audience that will hear them. And this is not such an appealing um, uh, role because it takes us out of our typical uh, role. There are, uh, Australia has started doing a bit of this, they call it hot tubbing. Um, and they, uh, yeah, the American lawyers are not enthusiastic, as you might imagine. Uh, could answer juror questions after giving uh, testimony, that's um, a majority said uh, they would find that attractive. If you think about these, you can see how they link with the kind of training you're getting and the people who are teaching you. That is, the idea is you're trying to convey information, you care whether the students, i.e. the jurors, are in fact understanding what you're saying. Um, and these are more appealing parts of the process. So, um, have we gotten uh, uh, very far with these? Well, not so far in some of them, uh, pretty far on others. More cases now do have permit jurors to submit uh, questions, but it's still uh, a hard sell. There's even one judge, federal judge in Texas, who last year had a big patent case um, and uh, I wrote an affidavit for uh, uh, the, one of the attorneys in the case. The judge was not going to send a copy of the jury instructions back to the jury room for del during deliberations. Right? Now, we recommend that they send a copy for each member of the jury, but he wasn't even going to send one. So I wrote an affidavit at request, and I s explained that when I teach IP at Northwestern, my students are very smart. They are very smart, but even they need to study hard to understand patent jury instructions, right? Um, but the judge did not, I did not persuade the judge, which sometimes happens. Uh, and of course, the jurors first questions when they went back to deliberate to the judge were about the instructions that they didn't understand. So he kind of paid for it, okay. in my view. Okay, um, uh, crossing uh, into the legal silo. So we're uh, talking uh, about um, Northwestern now, and Northwestern has probably more uh, JD PhDs on the uh, faculty at the law school than any other law school in the country. Our former dean, uh, David Van Zandt, uh, was um, a, a, an initiator of that uh, trend, and other law schools now have come to adopt that. JD PhDs are, uh, are strong uh, candidates 
um, for positions in law schools across the uh, uh, country now. And um, the, we, uh, so at Northwestern, we have folks with um, PhDs in uh, political science, in psychology, in um, economics, but also in genetics. And so there is a wide range of disciplines represented even here on our, on our uh, uh, faculty. Um, so I hope there will be an occasion for you to come down to the law school, if not to take a course, um, but maybe to some events here. We have a strong and active um, uh, MSL program for Masters in Science and Law. But uh, I chair the uh, Northwestern JD PhD program. And I'd be happy to take any questions about it. Uh, we will, as I said, be having several people from engineering who will be joining the, January, the, the September class. They will start out for two years in Evanston, and then they will come down to uh, uh, the law school and do two years uh, at the law school. But they are, um, uh, they are uh, uh, it's a small program. We do pretty strong uh, tailoring. And they have been, after the JD PhD, taking jobs either in their disciplinary departments, in their PhD departments, or at law schools. They've done a whole variety of things. Um, and uh, they are, they are an, an, interesting, an interesting group. They're fun uh, to uh, deal with. And um, you will get to deal with them next year. So thank you. <laughs>